Well, it's an honor to be here with you this afternoon and tomorrow afternoon. Uh, I actually am an old Washington boy myself, wasn't born here, but I graduated from high school on the eastern side of the state from Richland High School years ago. My dad preached there for a number of years, and, and there's really no place like the Northwest. You guys right here, it's about 100 degrees in Alabama and in Texas and all throughout the South, and we can walk outside, and you just get that brisk little, ooh, this is just a little chilly, you know? It's, it's comfortable and good, and so it's a... It's a great thing to be here with you today. My topic this afternoon, uh, Ken, he told me that we were conducting this workshop and that the general theme was going to be about faith. And boy, that gets you all excited when you're a preacher because there is nothing better to preach on than faith. But then he said, now here are your individual themes. And the first one was sin, the defeat of faith. Now, do you think that's fair that the young guy gets stuck with sin? I mean, I get, I, have, I get to preach on sin. But really, when I, the more I got to thinking about it and studying about it and reflecting on the importance of this topic, the truth came to the surface, and that is this. Really, we can't preach about faith if we don't preach about sin. And really, we can't preach about hope if we don't preach about sin. And, and whether we want to admit it or not, and the truth is we don't want to admit it, but we cannot really understand anything that is wonderful and encouraging and hope-filled about being a Christian until we understand why it is wonderful, encouraging, and hope-filled. And that begins with an understanding of the gravity and of the wretchedness of the disease that plagues our species, the disease of sin. But we do, we do typically avoid it. I remember hearing about a preacher back in Kentucky who was doing a meeting and they said, we want you to come do us a meeting and preach on sin. He said, all right, if that's what you all want. So he came in and the first night he preached a, a lesson and he, he got passionate and, and got down and, and real about the subject of, of tobacco, the sin of tobacco. And they pulled him aside after that lesson and said, now brother... We understand what you're trying to do, but you can't preach on tobacco again. This is Kentucky. I mean, you understand that a third of our membership, they're, they're tobacco farmers. You can't preach about that. So he said, oh, okay. So the next night, he got up and he said, tonight I'm going to preach about the sin of alcohol. I'm going to preach about the sin of booze. And he preached a lesson. They pulled him aside afterwards again. Brother, you understand, you cannot preach about the sin of liquor. This is Kentucky. And a third of our membership works in the bourbon distilleries right here. You can't preach about that. So the third night of the meeting, he got up and he preached about the sin of gambling. And they pulled him aside after church and said, Brother, what are you doing? This is Kentucky. You can't preach about the sin of gambling here. Don't you know that a third of our membership raises pure Kentucky thoroughbreds? He said, brethren, what do you want me to preach on? They said, why don't you preach on heathens? I think there's some of them in the county next door. And, you know, we think about what it means to really talk about sin. And brethren, the truth is, and I can say this from personal experience, we just don't do it. I don't preach on it that much. I preach on faith quite a bit. I preach on hope quite a bit. I preach on the resurrection and what that means to us quite a bit. I preach on godly living and the positive aspects of being the kind of people that we're supposed to be for God, but really talking about the disease of our souls is something we avoid or, or we make light of it. Have you ever heard us do that? I'm brand new to Alabama. Been there a month and a half. Loving it. Those people are so sweet. We were over at their house one day and somebody was mentioning something. They were joking. It wasn't truly derogatory, but they were talking about another sister in the church and they said, well, you know, sister, and somebody else said, now don't gossip. She said, honey, you know this is Alabama. It's not gossip as long as you say, bless their heart. That's the rule in Alabama. <laughs> you can say anything you want about somebody, bless his heart. He, he's just a scoundrel, bless his heart. 
And I thought to myself, how typical is that of us? Either we don't talk about sin or, at all, or we make light of it. We make light of it. When the reality is, when we look in the Scriptures and really the message of everything that matters, the very problem with this world is not just that people need, as every commercial we would hear would say, the solution to all a man's problems is education. I, I, I agree, people need more education about a lot of things. But that is not the problem with the world. And people would talk about the difficulties because of poverty in this world. And poverty is a horrible thing. But that is not the core root problem of this world. And we could talk about uh, political issues. And we could talk about war and famine and all sorts of things. But the problem with this world is, will be in the future, and has always been. Three little letters. The problem with this world is the disease of sin. But when we look at our lives, we know that sin is the universal curse. It is man's genocidal disease. It's the worst enemy that any of us have, and the truth is, is the worst enemy that any of us have is ourselves. Because the sin that makes this world such a bad place doesn't just begin in other people's lives. The truth is, is that sin begins in me. Because as much as I want to preach and encourage and talk about all the wickedness in this world, the truth is, is that I remain a sinner. That all of us struggle. All of us are broken hearted about our own sin. So why is it that we avoid it? Why is it that over the last, I don't know how many generations or decades in the church, that it has been kind of glossed over, candy-coated? Why? Well, I think there's a few thoughts on that. First of all, we're reluctant to identify that enemy within. Because the truth is, we kind of like him don't we? That man within us that struggles with stuff, that man within us that we're ashamed of half the time, the other half of the time, he's our best buddy. We struggle because we like him. The second reason I think we avoid it is because, well, he's on the inside. He won't just come out and fight like a man. Isn't that true? I mean, you look at the you that you're ashamed of in your more spiritual moments, and the truth is, is he'll run in those times. He won't come out today at this lectureship. He will retreat far within. And this is when you want him to come out. Come on out. Let's deal with this. Let's face it. I'm going to toe the line, and we're going to get rid of this in my... Oh, he's going to retreat. Far, far within. He won't come out, and he won't just fight like a man. And then, the truth is, is that I think another reason that we have trouble dealing with sin is because it's hard for us to admit the true wretchedness within ourselves. And part of that is cultural. We live in the great self-esteem society, where it's really not popular. It really would be thought to be not a wise thing for people to say things like men would say in the Bible when they see God, even though Isaiah was a pretty holy and moral and good, probably the best man in his entire nation at that time. He would fall down in the face of God and he would say, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live amongst a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, in wretchedness, groveling in the dirt. You would see men over their sin. It says they would tear their clothes. We're going to see that in our text today in Joshua chapter 7. Tear their clothes and pour ashes on their head. And let me tell you, folks, that's just not very dignified. It's just not a way to, to appear that we feel good about ourselves. And in the Bible, the truth is, is that people are generally broken before they find any worth. 
They don't find worth in their own positive self-talk in Scripture. They find worth in the worth that God places in them. But we don't want to admit, we don't want to face, we don't want to come to grips with the reality of the wretchedness of the helplessness in our own lives. I, I, it's always frustrated me because I want to be a spiritual man and I am not the man I want to be. Anybody else in that boat, you don't have to raise your hand, but I am not the man I want to be. Some days I'm more that man than other days. But a, a while ago, a couple years back, when I was in a little bit of a, a, a poetic mood over the course of several months, I penned these words, and, and I feel this way often when I'm honest in the deep, dark recesses of my mind. I feel this way. It says, I go through cycles in my life, times of weakness and of strength. The bad times seem to last too long, and the good ones are too short of length. But what I desire is always clear. What I want in my inner man. I want to be a man of great courage and faith, always ready to take a stand. So why do I cycle through times in my life? Sometimes feeling like the man I should be, then falling into another slump when consistency is just too hard to see. Why can't I always share your word? Why can't I pray all the time? Why am I sometimes more concerned with myself or so concerned with every dime? This is not who I want to be. I want to live as I should each day. But alas, my life is filled with mistakes as I try to walk in your way. So I know no other recourse than to come to you as I've done for my soul's every crime and beg you, Lord, to help me to be spiritual all the time. And I can tell you, many times as I reflect by myself in honesty, I'm burdened by the wretchedness of my own soul. And I'm not alone. We are not alone. Romans chapter 7 tells us that we are in good company. Because the Apostle Paul in that passage, that seems so kind of disjointed in the Scripture, doesn't it? Like, why is this here? Because he'll say, oh, wretched man that I am. He says, the things that I would do, those things I doest not. And the things that I hate, those things I do. Things that I hate. Oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body? Who can deliver me from this body of death? And we know that's not the end of the story because although those who compiled our English translations separated chapter 7 and chapter 8, you understand that immediately following that is 8, 1, and 2. Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walketh not according to the flesh, but who walk according to the Spirit. So Paul isn't trying to give us this gloomy picture that there's no hope because of the sin we continue to struggle with. He's trying to help us, I believe, to see that it is part of the human condition. That the reality is in Christ Jesus is that no matter who we are, if we're a Kerry Williams or if we're someone sitting here in Tacoma, Washington today, or if we are even the Apostle Paul himself, the truth is sin is the disease of mankind. And it is a disease that requires constant, constant treatment. Requires constant treatment. And that brings us this morning, this afternoon, excuse me, to our text from Judges chapter 7, if you'd turn there. And here we have the story of, that is, I think, so interesting, the story of Achan. Now, we could read through the whole thing, but that would take a good portion of our time, so I'll recap it for just a moment, and then we'll touch on some highlights. But you remember that they'd just come off of that great victory over Jericho. 
A victory that was truly and vividly only attributable to God and His power. I mean, you remember the whole story. They went around the city and they blew their horns and God in His mightiness destroyed the walls of the city and they were completely victorious. They're on an absolute high. They've come across the Jordan River. They thought, we can't take the land. They're in fear. But they defeat this powerful, great city. And they don't even have to raise a sword to do it. But now they face another city, the city of Ai. Now the interesting thing about Ai is compared to Jericho, it was just a little bitty place. It wasn't a military powerhouse of Canaan. It was just kind of an insignificant little city. And so they even see that in the text because they say, oh, well, we've beaten. We've beaten Jericho. AI won't be any problem at all. So they just send up a few thousand men to go and to take this little easy conquest of AI. But what happens? You remember? The men are routed. They're chased away. They run away in fear from the men of AI. And 36... Of the men of Israel lose their lives. Well, Joshua is very dismayed by this fact. In fact, the text tells us that he goes and he, like we mentioned before, he tears his clothes, he puts ashes upon his head, and he cries out to God, and and it's a little bit challenging. You'll see that in Scripture with men who have confidence in their faith in the Lord and have a true relationship with God. Sometimes they'll even be direct in their prayers. And he'll say, God, why is it that you've allowed this to happen? You told us to come over into Canaan and now we lose. And right there in the midst of that, God will tell him, get up off the ground. And he'll tell him about that there's sin in the camp Because someone, and we know of course that it's Achan, has went and has taken some of the things of Jericho that God had commanded everything there was to be destroyed. But he had gone through and taken some things, some of the riches for himself. So in the course of the rest of the chapter, Joshua will go and he will start a search. And he will work his way through the tribes. And he'll work through the tribes, then he'll work through the clans, then he'll work through the families, till finally he finds the guilty party. And he pleads with Achan, admit what you've done. Achan finally comes out and says, oh, I've stolen. I've rebelled against God. He and his family are taken out. They're stoned. They're killed. And then the children of Israel go forth in battle and win against AI. Now there are many, many things that we could discuss from that passage. And that was a very brief overview of the story. But there's just a few points that I'd like to share, just a few obvious observations about sin and its effect in our lives that I think come forth from the pages of that passage. Number one, God's people can only be defeated, and this is important, God's people can only be defeated from within. You remember that we are promised a lot of things in Scripture. And God keeps His promises. In fact, the entire Scriptures from the very first page to the very end will reassert the idea all the way through that God is a God of faithfulness. That He is a God that when He gives His Word, that Word is fulfilled. Again and again, from the story of of Abraham to the story of Moses to the stories all the way through, God keeps His promises. We're promised in the New Testament. Yet in Him we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, neither height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, will be able to separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are not losers, we are winners in Christ Jesus. And it's not because of anything, any ability within us, it's because God is faithful. That's the only reason. And if we go forth and obey His commands and go forth in faith, we have the victory. It's just simple. 
except sometimes we lose. In fact, in all of the conquest of Canaan, this is the only loss. Why do we lose? It wasn't because the Israelites weren't as good as soldiers. They weren't as good as soldiers. They were a bunch of slave sheep herders. It wasn't because they weren't as well equipped. They weren't as well equipped. But they still won every single other battle. The reason they lost this one is because there was sin in the camp. They were not destroyed from without. They were destroyed from within. And we can go through, and the truth is we fear so many things. But the truth is that it's the only way we can be defeated is by ourselves. You see, when a boat begins to sink, it's not the water on the outside of the boat that's the problem. It's the water on the inside of the boat. When you take and you throw a bottle in the sea, the bottle will float forever when it is in the sea, but it'll sink when the sea is in it. Isn't that true? The defeat of God's people in Joshua chapter 7 and the defeat of our churches and our individual lives, I believe, every single time when we have faced heartache and despair and agony because we have ended up in defeat rather than victory in our spiritual lives, it is not because of that which is out there. It is not because Satan is better at what he does. It is not because the world, and I hear this in the church all the time, the world is getting to be a worse place. The world is cyclical. It gets better, it gets worse. Just study history, you'll see that. It's not because of that. It's not because of what's on the outside of the boat, folks. It's because of what the water on the inside of the boat. We look at passages like Matthew chapter 16. And this is a text that we've all heard and studied so many times where he, Jesus is talking about the kingdom and he says, Simon bar Jonah, you're a Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades, and I love this phrase, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I think in that, if you read it closely, there's a hint as to the victorious nature of God's people. Because I have never in my life heard of an army that took its city gates on the offense, on campaign. Gates are not an offensive thing. They're a defensive thing. Isn't that right? I mean, you never see or hear about armies that had siege engines, siege towers, catapults, and their city gates with them. No. The only thing city gates are good for is holding up in defense until finally the enemy breaks through. And the Bible does not describe, Jesus does not describe His people as being a people who are holed up in defense. He describes them as pushing the enemy so far back that He is on the defense. And God's people, God's church is on the offense. You see, Jericho represents the world which we can beat every single time, but Ai... AI represents the flesh that if we are not careful will defeat us. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 5 through 8 leads us to the second observation that comes out of the text. It says, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the entire lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That brings us to the second observation, and that is that corruption can contaminate and destroy the whole. In verses 11 through 12 of our text, it says, Israel has sinned, they have transgressed my covenant, for I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived. 
Therefore, verse 12, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies. Now what's interesting is that he says, the children of Israel have done this. How many people in the, children, in the army of Israel had actually done what he said? How many of them had stolen the things? Was it a whole horde of them? No, it was just, and this is interesting, it was just one, Achan. Yet God says the children of Israel stole it. When he talks about the idea of leaven, he's saying that it is possible for a little bit of corruption to completely distort and corrupt the larger whole. That was true in Israel. Because of Achan's sin, all of Israel paid the price. It was true of Ananias and Sapphira. The concern with the Holy Spirit with them, because they lied to him about that amount, is the idea there is that, of course, they were corrupting the church as a whole. And all the way through when it talks about church discipline, the concept again and again and again is that a little bit of wickedness will eventually destroy the whole. And brethren, that may be the most important message of this passage for us today. Because I believe sometimes we think that a little bit really doesn't make a big difference. We think that, and I know we could talk about so many different ways that this affects us, but I, I, it's hard. As a parent, it's hard. It was just this few months ago that my little daughter came. She's just in junior high for the first time. And she came and, Daddy, I, I, I want to go to the, to the dance, the homecoming dance. Well, y'all may have different views about that, but I just didn't feel that was the best place for my daughter to be and to go. And she was the only the only one of her friends, including at church, that wasn't allowed to go. And, and I'll tell you, it was so hard. Even though I didn't feel that was right for her. And I, I wasn't trying to be judgmental of anybody else. But just that was our decision. And I remember we went to, it was after the homecoming football game. And where we were living in Texas, everybody goes to football games. I mean, that and church. I mean, those two things are, are high on people's priority list. And you go and, I mean, we're sitting there and in the middle of the game. And Rianne's always off doing something with somebody all the time. Never even see her. She's off with her friends. But halfway through the game, she comes, she just sits beside me. And I said, honey, what's wrong? She says, oh, well, my friends were talking about what they're going to wear to the dance after the game. And she said, yeah, and I just, you know, and she started just to tear, started to stream down her face. And I'll tell you, my heart just about fell out of my chest. And she went off to get some popcorn or something because, you know, I pulled out, I don't know, it might have been a 50. I don't know what I gave her, just whatever was in my pocket. I mean, that's what she got. And I said, baby, baby, why don't you go, you, anything you want, honey, you go ahead. Because I, I felt like it was my fault. It was the world's fault. But I felt like it was my fault. And when she went away, I turned over to her mother. And I said, Lenora, maybe it's not such a big deal. You, you felt that way, right? Maybe it's not such a big deal. I mean, this is early Texas. I, they still say a prayer before they start class in the public schools in early Texas. I mean, it's just, surely there's not going to be anything going on at that. I mean, one of the elders at the church is a chaperone. It's going to be okay. But then Lenore said, honey, remember what we decided? We don't know. We're preaching family. We might be living in downtown Houston when she's in high school. And if we set a precedent, it may be a problem to break later on. I said, I know that was good wisdom. But you see, at that moment, I wanted to reduce the things which my conscience said were not right to things that were justifiable. I wanted to make the little things little. And we do it all the time. We do it at the box office when we buy a ticket 
Every week that we go see a movie. We do it as we flip through the channels, don't we? We do it as we're surfing the web. As some of the jokes that people send us on our email that we just hit the forward button with. I mean, and on and on. And I'm not trying to... I'm not saying that we're big bad sinners. I'm not a big bad sinner. But the problem is, is that when I get to feeling like my little sins are okay, I don't realize that God is disgusted with the aching in my life. And that that little thing can actually cause my defeats. Can actually cause my defeats. And that brings us to the third observation. And that is simply this. The time to deal with sin is immediately. I look at things like verses 10 and 13. So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie down on your face? Joshua, I understand you're praying about this, but the time for praying has passed and the time for doing has come. And folks, sometimes there's a time to get off our knees. Did you know that? And to get up and fix it. Verse 13, it says, Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from your midst. I appreciated what Brother John said last night about never giving up the importance of the invitation in our congregations. Because brethren, when we stop confessing our sins to one another, and it's almost gotten there sometimes with us, when we stop confessing our sins, when we stop admitting that there's the little weaknesses in my life that are going to destroy me if I don't get them out, then we have relegated our existence to defeat. We must do something about it, and we must do it. Sometimes the process can be long. He had to go through the tribes. He had to go through the clans. He had to go through the families. But it is important that we root out sin. It's important, of course, that we flee from sin. You know, temptation, we talk about that justifying. Temptation is something where we're tempted just to harbor the few little things in our lives and to let them remain. You remember in the Old Testament the most vivid story of that, of all of them, is of Samson. Samson was God's man. He was a victor. He was powerful. He could defeat all of his enemies. And it only took... And and realize this. With Samson and Delilah, he knew what she was trying to do to him. He knew it. Because all the way through, well, she, she is trying to ask him, well, what is the secret of your strength? Now, I can, I've always tried to figure this out. Why would Samson have stayed after the first lie? Have you ever thought about that? She goes and he tells her, he makes up a lie. She does exactly what he said and has the Philistines waiting for him. And he's still with her in the next verse. Is that not unbelievable? He is exactly like we are. He is exactly like we are. He thinks that he can flirt with sin and the affair will never happen. You flirt with sin. I don't care what the sin is. It can be a sexual sin. It can be a sin of of pride. It can be a sin of, of so many other different things. But brethren, when you flirt with sin, it will always lead to your eventual demise. Cannot be flirted with. Because Samson threw out it. He kept control for a little while. He told her one, two, three, and it three lies before finally. It says she nagged him day by day. And that's the nature of sin. Till finally exasperated, he told her the truth. And he lost it all. And I think about the nature of temptation. I think about the nature of our weaknesses. The truth is that every one of us in here there are one or two areas in our lives where we're more susceptible to temptation. I, 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 in all honesty, you could lay a vial of, I don't even know if it comes in vials, but you could lay heroin or, or crack cocaine or any of those things right here on that podium and everybody in here could leave and i tell you the truth, I wouldn't be tempted with that. I'm just not tempted by that. I've never experienced that in my life. It's not a weakness of mine. But there are other things, and I won't go into it, but there are other things, and you know it's true in your life too. There are other things you sit here, and everybody in this room leaves, and I'm going to struggle. 
We're going to struggle. Because we all have, now pay attention to this, we all have our palisade walls. Remember the story of the Alamo in Texas? Remember the Alamo? Oh, what a great story of heroism. Where just a handful of men fought off a great and terrible army of the Mexicans in Santa Ana. But you remember that in the course of that, Travis, who was trying to command the defense of the Alamo, and those few less than 200 men, I believe, isn't that right? I mean, there he's commanding those few brave men, but the only hope he got in the whole course of the whole story was a very famous man rode in with a few of his Tennessee boys. Do you remember that? Davy Crockett, the king of the wild frontier, if you watch Disney movies. And he rode in, remember, in all of his, all of his reputation. He'd been a senator. He'd been a hero. And he rides in, and that gives the men encouragement, and that gives them hope. But see, the Alamo was an interesting thing. It was a fort. But it had one weak side. It had the palisade wall. The other three walls were all made of brick, mortar, and stone. And they had cannons mounted. To breach those, Santa Ana would have had to pound them with cannonballs for months to even break through. And while he did, they'd be pouring hot oil down and shooting them from the siege ladder. But there was one spot where they knew the enemy would hit them the hardest. There was a palisade wall of just logs that had been cut down and made into kind of a spiked wall. It was weak. It was poorly fortified. And everybody knew it would fall first. Do you know that you have palisade walls in your life? And so do I. But I think that even though that battle was lost, forget that part for a minute, that we do need to follow Travis's example because he did the wise thing. You know what he did? He knew it was the weakest spot. So he gave it his best. Davy Crockett and the Tennessee boys gave their lives defending the Palisade Wall. And brethren, I don't know what your best is. And I don't know, and I don't care to know what your palisade wall is. But I'll tell you, it is the spot, because Satan knows it. It is the spot where you will fall the fastest. Because you ever wonder, why is it that I fall with the same thing in my life? Because you do. Why do I fall again and again and again and again? Because we all have our weak spots. And we need to know it because the enemy does. We need to give it our best to defend it. That means be conscious of it. That means if it's something that tempts us, don't be around it. That means avoid it at all costs. <laughs> Brethren, if your problem is greed and you're very successful and you own a business, maybe you need to change your line of work and be a teacher. Don't you think? And I know that's radical. Are you just going to let Santa Ana climb over the wall? Or are you going to do something about it? If you struggle with lust, you might not need an internet connection in your life. If you struggle with pride, you may need to be open and honest about that with people rather than continually building yourself up. I don't know what it is, but Satan does, and he will use it. When we think about our lives, the time to deal with sin is not later, it is now. See, we are the army of God. We are the precious bride of Christ. What can defeat us? The Bible says if we walk with Him and if our faith is whole and if we are walking in the light, it doesn't mean perfection, 
But if we're walking in the light and constantly, what does he say? If we confess our sins, he will forgive us of our sins. We are more than conquerors. Because you understand that Troy, as we read in that great epic, the Iliad, Troy held off the Greeks for 10 years. They could never breach her walls until they brought the Trojan horse inside. It's not the water on the outside of the boat that'll sink us. It's the water on the inside. Thank you so much.